Good evening, everybody. Welcome. I'm Jennifer LaRue. I'm hosting tonight's program on behalf of the Mark Twain House and Museum and really delighted to have two wonderful uh, guests uh, speaking tonight. Um, we're going to have a great conversation about Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn and Mark Twain. Um, and I'm so delighted to see so many of you already chatting away in the chat area. Uh, please keep doing that throughout the program. That's one of the delightful things about this virtual programming uh, setting that we've all gotten so accustomed to over the past two years. Um, so again, thank you for being here. I have a few little housekeeping duties to perform before I introduce our guests. I'll try to keep it short. Uh, again, you're chatting away in the chat. At the very top of the chat is a link. Or actually, tonight there are two links uh, through which you can purchase your own copies of the books we're talking about tonight, Tom Sawyer Returns and Taming Huck Finn. Um, these are uh, signed copies that you'll be ordering. And I want you to know that if, you know, we know you can get these books elsewhere. We're no dummies. Um, but if you do purchase through the Mark Twain House, uh, know that your purchase benefits the Mark Twain House and Museum. And uh, that purchase is very, very much appreciated. While we're talking about uh, support and appreciation, uh, I'd ask you to just cast your gaze down to that long green bar that says, show your love, which is so cute. Uh, donate here to support the Mark Twain House and Museum. Uh, you know, we've been doing this now for almost two years. And I think the Mark Twain House and Museum has done more than 200 of these crowdcasts during that time. We've been thrilled to be able to remain connected with audiences throughout the pandemic. Um, and we're really glad to kind of be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. But I would say that, you know, it, it, the programs are generally free. We don't charge admission for them, but they aren't free to put on. Um, and so if you've been a fan or if you're, this is your first night uh, joining us and you enjoy yourself, uh, which I hope you will, uh, please consider making a donation of some size uh, to uh, show your appreciation and to support the continued programming, both uh, on, online and eventually we're starting to offer in-person uh, programs again uh, very shortly. So um, just know that whether you're able to share $5 or $50 or whatever, every single penny is put to very, very good use by the hardworking staff at the Mark Twain House and Museum. And every single penny is deeply appreciated by the board of trustees and the staff. So thank you for all of that. So I do, while I'm thanking people, I want to thank our sponsors uh, tonight's program, like all of our virtual programs, is sponsored by the Wish You Well Foundation and by our media sponsor, Connecticut Public, WNPR. It's also produced in part with support honoring the legacy of Frank Lord, who was one of our trustees. He passed away not too long ago, and it really gives us joy to be able to offer these programs uh, in memory of, of, of Frank. Uh, if you enjoy this program and want more, please visit marktwainhouse.org. We have a full list of all the programs that are coming up, again, both virtual and in person. We talked about purchasing the book. So I think it's time now for me to introduce our guest. Oh, I forgot one thing. Um, we are going to have a Q&A uh, session toward the end of our program. Uh, if you have a question for either uh, EE or for Rebecca tonight, um, please post your question not in the chat, because that makes it hard for me to find. And I'm going to come back up to help with that part. If you could please put your question down at the bottom of the screen where you see ask a question, that'll make it much easier for us to manage that part of the program. So thank you in advance for your cooperation. So I'm going to introduce three people, um, one of whom will only be on screen, uh, maybe not at all. Uh, we have Brian Roy, who is the Assistant Manager of Interpretation at the Mark Twain House and Museum. And he's going to be uh, a camera person showing you some scenes from inside the Mark Twain House and Museum this very moment, this very evening. He's um, roaming around there and is going to share um, some live uh, video of, of that scene, or of those scenes. So that's a real treat to get a peek at the Mark Twain House and where Mark Twain lived and worked and raised his family, and especially at this time of night when it's too close to the public. Our moderator tonight, who can be in conversation with E.E. E. Burke, is Rebecca Floyd, who's the Director of Interpretation at the Mark Twain House and Museum, a long time and much valued staff member there. So E.E. E. Burke, she describes herself as a history geek and a sucker for a good love story. She's recently released a new edition of her best-selling series, Steam, Romance and Rails, which combines Western action and adventure with romance and suspense. 
Another five-star series, The New Adventures, features a reimagining of two beloved American characters. Guess who? In Tom Sawyer Returns and Taming Huck Finn. Uh, her novella, Victoria, Bride of Kansas, is part of the multi-author American Mail Order Bride series, is a Kindle Top 100 bestseller and a semi-finalist in the 2016 Kindle Best Book Awards. Uh, EE has earned accolades in regional and national contests, including RWA's prestigious Golden Heart. Uh, she's done a million things, so I'm going to let her come on screen and talk to you. So uh, everybody, please join me in welcoming E.E. E. Burke, Rebecca Floyd, and um, eventually Brian Roy. So give me just a moment, if you would, to bring everybody up on screen and up on mic. And good evening, E.E. E. Good morning, evening, Rebecca. How are you both? Great, great. Great, it's wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. And yes, uh, Jacques has very kindly pointed out that we do have some polls for you to participate in. So much going on tonight. Uh, so you can buy the book, you can donate to the museum, you can sit back and listen to the chat, you can ask a question and you can answer our polls. We have four of them and uh, they might add to the fun and we'll, we'll uh, reveal the poll results at the end of our evening. So Rebecca, will you please let me know when it's time for me to come back up and help I with the sure I will, absolutely. Awesome. Well, I'm going to sit back and enjoy like everybody else. Have fun. Thanks, Jennifer. Hello, EE. E. How are you tonight? I'm doing great, man. I'm happy, ready for this. Happy Valentine's Day. Yes, to you guys, too. They're at the Mark Twain House and Museum. Oh, yes, we thought it fitting for this, this uh, discussion of, of your works uh, to, to broadcast for Valentine's Day from the Mark Twain House. So I am in the Clemens bedroom on the second floor of Mark Twain's house in Hartford, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So behind me is the angel bed that Sam and Olivia Clemens shared. Mark Twain, AKA Samuel L. Clemens. Oh, uh, and where are you? I'm in Kansas City. I'm sitting in my office. So All right. I have a, a, my muse sitting up here uh, in his white suit. Some of you may recognize Mr. Twain up there. So he keeps oh. me company. Oh. And uh, for, you know, some of the, the folks out there who may not be real familiar with uh, with Mark Twain House and what we do here, uh, the, the house is beautifully restored. It was built in 1874. And uh, Samuel Clemens or Mark Twain and his uh, wife, Olivia, who we'll talk about a little bit tonight, too, I think, uh, they uh, lived here for 17 years. And when we're talking about the original stories, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn and the Adventures of Tom Sawyer, these were written during this 17 year period. Uh, and our, our spotlight cam may be coming up with the place where Mark Twain actually wrote his books. Oh, one of them. Oh, uh, and uh, so hopefully we'll be able to see that a little bit too. He's up in the billiard room where Mark Twain did his writing. And are you in the space where you do your writing right now? I am. I am. I am in my space that I do my writing. Now I'm not right at the desk. I don't write at the secretary. This is a book. This is a book desk actually. And it has a lot of my research books in it. So um, that's what I'm sitting in front of. But yes, this is where I do my work. Can you hope that one day people will go on pilgrimages, you know, 100 years from now to see where you wrote your books? <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> sure. Yes. I don't know. This house isn't nearly as cool as that house. Oh, uh, and says, uh, and Mark Twain wrote in the uh, up in the billiard room where that green lampshade is. That's the corner where he wrote mm. his stories. So one that of the places where he wrote. Oh, oh, uh, and so tell us a little bit about about your your backstory and how did how did you become a writer? Well, um, about 15 years ago, I launched out to uh, start pursuing my dream of writing novels. And, um, you know, that, that's kind of how it started is just, you know, like people say, butt in chair and write. <laughs> so uh -huh. that's what I started doing. Um, and I, you know, I spent a lot of time um, 
study writing techniques and and I joined uh, several writing groups locally and um, in fact I have a lot of friends online now from one of those groups uh, MRW and these are phenomenal people and I don't think I'd be here now talking to you about these two books if not for these people that support me friends with MRW they're they're an amazing support team so I you know I've been writing like I said about 15 years and about 10 years ago decided I wanted to write these books that were spinoffs of Mark Twain's novels. And so that's, you know, how that kind of came about was, you know, me thinking about the books that have most influenced me. Uh, when I was a child, I read these books. I read them again in high school. Um, when I began to write, I began to write during the time period that Mark Twain lived. And I've been fascinated by that time period in American history. It was just such a era of change. And um, so I, I began to look at writing books in that era. And it was just kind of natural that when I began to think about, well, if I want to do a derivative fiction or if I want to write about literary characters and, and you know, kind of put them in more of a romantic setting or whatever, who would I do? And, you know, Huckleberry Finn, I mean, <laughs> Who else? You know, really? Yeah. What is it? What is it that captivated you? Because that's also it's on your website that you have just adored these characters for a long, long time. What was it that brought you brought Mark Twain into your world? Uh, you know, I think it was just like I said, reading growing up and and becoming kind of attached to these characters and, and then attached to him as I read more about him as an author. Uh, and as I began to write, of course, then I did read a lot more about him as an author because I was seeking out authors to look at that really had influenced me. So um, so I, you know, I uh, began to kind of think about the characters that I was going to write about. And I thought, you know, this I always wanted to know what happened to these boys. Uh, I Twain doesn't tell us. And he wrote some sequels to Tom, but they were he was still a boy. He wasn't a man. And so he didn't tell us, he didn't tell us what happened to them, but I was just curious and, and I wanted to know what happened. And finally I thought, well, you know, maybe I just need to go write that because I think there are other people out there who want to know what happened to them. So this is my, you know, this is my take on what I think could have happened to them had they been actual people who lived during that time period. And, um, and, and really, I think that if you, if you, if you realize that Tom and Huck are actually based on real people in Twain's time period. They're, they're, they're people that he was associated with, they're childhood friends. And, and he even talks about who they are, you know, in some of his books. And so you could imagine Tom and Hug being real people because in a sense they are. And, uh, and so that, that's kind of how I came to, I came to those characters. And I just have always found them charming. So oh. now uh, would you say, cause you know, uh, you know, I, that, that you, one of the things that I was charmed by with these stories was uh, how how you pick up all these threads and these nuggets from from the original story and and from Mark Twain's real life. So would you say that? A, 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 but you don't have to have read them to enjoy your stories, right? Right. right. Well, um, uh, but yeah, I just I loved all the little all the little nuggets and how where you drew from these these stories that Mark Twain wrote. And, and can you tell us a little bit more about how, say with, with Huckleberry Finn, how did you turn him into a grown up? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, really it, tying it all together, I read the books themselves and really just immerse myself back in those books again to understand the children. Then I began to read a lot about Mark Twain's life and as a young man, what he did. And I could kind of sense that, Huck and Tom, in many ways, sort of reflect his growth as a, as a young man, kind of what happened to him. Um, you know, the adventurous young man, the young man who wants freedom, you know, that's Huck. And, uh, and so I, I, I really began to, to think about how do they sort of reflect in some ways Sam Clemens' own life and how would that inform these characters and, and shape them? And then how do they stay true to the nature of who they were their core personalities. And so um, some of the things about Clemens' life that gave me a few hints were the fact that he was, uh, you know, he was a steamboat pilot for a while. 
And I could totally see Huck ending up as a steamboat pilot. It just seemed so natural. Huck was a child of the river, you know, so it just made sense to me that he would end up that way. Um, and, you know, he, he Clemens, uh, for a very short time, served in the Civil War. I mean, that long, two weeks, you know, and then he was gone. And just for some reason, I just thought that is exactly what Huck would have done. He would have gone over there and gone, yeah, no, I'm out of here. <laughs> and so there's a part in the in the book that talks about that, where Tad asks him, you know, why didn't you fight? And he tries to explain that, how could I fight? I mean, I, I don't want to fight my friends. And, and yet at the same time, I can't support what they're doing. So I just left. Yeah. Can you set... Can you set the stage a little bit for for taming Huck Finn? Just to give us a little bit, a little morsel of a, of a, what's what's going on in Huck's life. Sure. Uh, so the story opens up. Uh, it it had to open up actually with Huck in a in a in a hogshead barrel on the river on the riverfront. I had that scene in my mind for like a long long time. Uh, that that's where Huck Huck would wake up and and he gets woken up by a young boy. And he discovers that he has been made guardian of an eight-year-old orphan. And he also discovers that the reason he's been made guardian, because he's this boy's uncle now, miraculously, that he was adopted by someone called Mrs. Douglas, that we may remember some from Huck and Tom's story when Twain wrote them. And, you know, if you recall, Huck stayed with Mrs. Douglas for a time. She really took care of him. She cared about him. And in my book, she took the step of adopting him. And it was kind of after he had cleared out, but she went ahead and did it. She went ahead and adopted him. And so now he's the he's the guardian of this young boy who's her grandson. And, you know, when I began to really think about this book, I thought, well, you know, when you write a book and, and you know, you need to have something that kind of um, gets people attached to a book, you know, kind of throws a character a curveball. So it'll make it interesting. Well, what's the worst curveball I could throw Huck? Well, he's uh, he has to take care of an orphan, a child. You know, that would be the last thing a guy who's footloose and fancy free would want to do. Well, what's the next worst thing? Well, if he has to tangle with a woman that reminds him of someone he just could not stand. And so the young woman who comes into his life reminds him of a younger version of old Miss Watson. She's a, you know, in his mind, when he first sees her, she's an old maid. She's not that old, but... When he first sees her, he's thinking, oh, my gosh, this is like a ghost of Miss Watson. She's come back to life. Yeah, they, they both make sort of snap judgments about yes. each other. Yes, they do. So, so anyway, the book takes off and, and, and it really is about Huck and Hallie is her name, trying to find a home for, for Tad. And they both have different ideas about what the best home would look like. Uh, and, and they they kind of battle each other the whole way. Hallie follows Huck and, and he can't get rid of her. And she's she's just determined to adopt this boy uh, who is her her dead sister's son. And Huck is just as determined to turn him over to Tom Sawyer because he's pretty sure that Tom is the right guy to raise Tad uh, and not him. So, you know, so the book uh, Taming Huck Finn really is a journey. It's a journey that they all three take to finding the right family for them. So, oh, uh, and, and, and you know, one of those nuggets is that it is it is a journey on a river, very much like Adventures of Huckleberry Finn is. Oh, but different river. Oh yeah, yeah. I you know, Huck grew up as a child of the Mississippi River, and in Twain's book, the river is 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 Huck, and Huck is the river. I mean, he's part of it, and and the river is very much a character in many ways in in the original tale of Huckleberry Finn. And I thought, well. As an adult, Huck would not stay there on the Mississippi because too much civilization, you know, there was too many people. There was too much of that going on. When he left at the end of his book, his first book, uh, he was heading out for the territory. Well, at that time, the territory was on the other side of the Missouri River. So I thought, well, he just naturally would end up on the Missouri River because it was a wild river, very untamed, doesn't didn't look anything like it looks now. Uh, and it was a dangerous river for steamboat pilots. There are wrecks of steamboats up and down that river. It, it was a very, very dangerous river. Most pilots on the Mississippi wouldn't even attempt it. So I thought, oh, yeah, Huck would totally come out here. He would totally be a part of this river. And so um, so the story set on the river and it and it really reflects his love for this river and, and how the river is like him in many ways. 
And uh, so, yeah. Yeah. One of the passages in Taming Huck that uh, that really spoke to me is when you describe or I get Huck is describing sort of the difference between mm -hmm. the, the Mississippi and the Missouri River. And how how did you come to learn so much about these these places? Well, well, uh, I travel to some of them, um, and I live in Kansas City, so I live on the Missouri River, and I've you know done a lot of local traveling around in Kansas and north of here, and you know over to St. Louis, and uh, so I've traveled quite a bit and, and seen the river, uh, and then I read a lot of. Um, diaries of steamboat pilots, things like that, anything that I could get my hands on that would give me sort of what I would call first person experience on the river of what it was like back then. And in utilizing that, I was able to imagine what it was like. So a lot of the passages where he's driving, you know, where he is behind the wheel of the boat and, and the movements he's making, and the things he's doing, those are coming out of those kind of descriptions by these pilots who had actually taken these boats up river and, and and it was just so neat to get into those descriptive passages firsthand you know when they were describing them so so yeah and then and you know for huck the difference between the rivers is important because um you know he 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 recognizes the fact that the missouri is a very different river it's a very wild river and where it pours into the mississippi the mississippi changes and becomes a different river from there on out and so in a sense, you know, Huck is, is, is really trying to find himself and bring together these two aspects of his life, um, you know, his, his past and his future and his present and kind of bring all that into alignment and find himself and also find where he belongs. So uh, one of the other little pieces that I delighted in is, is, is your character, Hallie. Oh, um, and how, how does she know something about steamboating? Is, uh, this it, is also drawn from Mark Twain's. It is. It is. Uh, I, I really was uh, struck by the fact that, um, you know, Sam Clemens, when he was a steamboat pilot, um, you know, he had a brother who served with him and he had a terrible tragedy when that brother was killed in a, in a steamboat explosion. And um, it, it really impacted him greatly. I don't know that it drove him off the river, but I'm sure it had something to do with the fact that he didn't go back to that after the war broke out and he could have gone back to it. Um, and so the character of Hallie, her father is a steamboat pilot. And so in many ways, she's like Huck in that she grew up, you know, with a father who was a steamboat pilot who, you know, plied the Mississippi, who was, you know, he, she just adored him, but he's killed in a terrible, terrible accident. And this just devastates her. And it causes her to decide that she will never be on the river again. She doesn't want to be on a river and she sure isn't gonna marry a steamboat pilot. And so this kind of sets up a, a, a difficulty for her to get over and to overcome is, is her fear of the river and her resistance to marrying um, Huck when he's a steamboat pilot and he's not gonna be anything else. Right. And, uh, and how does how does Huck learn how to be a steamboat pilot? <laughs> yeah, the same way that uh, Sam Clemens learned. He's apprenticed. And uh, that was the other part of it that I loved because I read a little bit about the apprenticeship of Sam Clemens in Life on the Mississippi that Mark Twain wrote. So I you know, read that and kind of, you know, loved that. And uh and then I looked at who was on the Missouri River and who was the big pilots on the Missouri River. And there was a pilot by the name of Grant Marsh, and he was quite famous um, as, as a very you know, adept and, and capable pilot up and down the Missouri River. And so there are a lot of tales about his life. And he mentored a lot of people. And I think he and Clemens may have served at one time on a ship together, but I think that was maybe on the Mississippi. Uh, not in Missouri. And in fact, the, the man who taught Clemens how to, um, you know, be a steamboat pilot took one trip on the Missouri River and said, uh-uh, never again. So, you know, it, it, that was just a really, really dangerous river. So, uh, so Grant Marsh was sort of the guy that I based uh, a lot of what Huck is going through and a lot of the challenges that he has and a lot of the dangers, they come from actual stories that Grant Marsh shares through, you know, books and diaries and, and other people talking about him. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's how he learns. He's an apprentice, just like young Sam Clements. Oh, uh, and one of the other things that sort of struck me 
uh, as I was reading Taming, Taming Huck, because well, yes, there is a love story here, but it's it's not all. It's also an exciting story about how these two characters grow and change. Uh, and I started to latch on to your use of the word uh, you, you use deformed, deformed conscience, deformed heart. Mm -hmm. You use um, um, the the sound heart, and and there's a very famous quote. Uh, by Mark Twain, where he talks about the adventures of Huckleberry Finn, uh, where he says he calls it uh, a book of mine where a sound heart and a deformed conscience come into collision and conscience suffers defeat. And I thought as I was reading is that this is a, a must be a quote that E.E. E. is has read and be familiar with and helped shape this story. Would you say that that's true? Yes. Yeah. And and actually, if you read, you know, Huckleberry Finn, he is constantly arguing with his conscience. And and what struck me was that as a boy, he's plagued by a conscience. And he, and, and Twain talks a lot about consciences being deformed largely by society, religious rules, things that, you know, that come to bear to kind of shape a conscience. And in, in Twain's view, deform it where you've got this heart that's operating, that's kind of guiding you the right direction. Um, and, and the way I saw it was as, as, as a man, you know, as a boy, Huck's plagued by a conscience that reflects cultural beliefs, things that he hasn't decided he believes. But ultimately, by the end of his book, he does have a very, a very strong sense of who he is as a young man. So as a man, what's going on? Um, and, and I think Huck would still be arguing with that conscience. He would still be trying to bring it in alignment with his heart. And, and so really through, throughout this book, you see him constantly arguing with his conscience about things. What am I going to do now? How am I going to deal with this? And, and, you know, ultimately his heart and his conscience have to come into alignment. And so that, that was a big part of the book and it was a big part of the original one. So, yeah, I did that. You, know, you you mentioned that you think that Huck is one of the most complex and fascinating characters mm -hmm. that Mark Twain created. What is it that 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 makes you say that? Um, I think he it, there is a lot more to Huck than most people think. Um, you know, when they meet him, they're not they, they think, well, he's uneducated or he's not very bright. Well, you know, that's not true. You know, if you've ever met people who might talk like Hicks, but they're really not. And they're pretty smart and they're pretty savvy, but it doesn't bother them to talk that way because it kind of throws people off. Um, but yeah, I think Huck was a very complex character because I think there was a lot of who Twain wanted to be, who he was in some ways, what he struggled with. Um, he had a difficult time fitting into society, kind of like Huck. Yeah, he, I think somebody described him as as kind of sage sagebrush what was it, a, a bohemian, sagebrush bohemian, you know, and he was also this literary figure. And so I think he constantly was trying to kind of bring these two parts of him into alignment. So I, I saw that in many ways complex like that. And uh, I was rereading one moment where uh, where Huck is, um, uh, he says he can he can play that role of yes. of the uh, of the hick so to speak he can yeah. he he knows that that's how people see him and he can play that role and he needs to uh and i think that uh that that's something sam clemens did too he could read his audience and knew what they expected of him oh yeah, yeah. definitely definitely oh uh you uh, had a passage from uh taming huck that you thought you might share with us yeah, it's a passage that you actually pointed out <laughs> to me um, where Huck is arguing with his conscience. And um, it, it's toward the end of the book, so I don't want to do a, a complete spoiler, but basically uh, Huck is struggling with the idea of not that he loves Hallie. I mean, he's decided by now he, he does, but he doesn't want to settle down and he doesn't want to live somewhere. And largely it's because he does not believe he is going to be able to fit in. He, he, he just doesn't think he can he can fit into society. And so he's fighting this idea of settling down. Hallie is not budging. She is not going to marry him if he's not willing to settle down. And, and so there's a lot of reasons for this. So in this scene, um, Huck has been just trying for quite a long time to convince Hallie 
to to marry him and and she's she's not giving in so he's fine he's arguing with the, his conscience but he's finally decided that he he's going to have to do something because they're you know the end of the journey is coming they've got to decide what to do with tad and he very much wants her to marry him so that they can all be together versus her taking tad or him taking tad so where this starts he's going up to uh to talk to her about it he threaded his fingers through his hair and muttered an oath Hallie hadn't given an inch on her refusal to marry him. He hadn't budged on her request to let Tad live with her part time. That would be the end of his hopes for giving the boy what he most wanted and needed two parents. You should have tried harder. Why? He'd made his intentions clear. He'd shown her every way. He, he knew how, how much he wanted to marry her. Heck, he didn't expect her to love him, but he hoped she would decide she could put up with him if for no other reason than for Tad's sake. He tromped down the stairs into the hall, dividing the officer's quarters. He hadn't seen her outside. She might be in her room. Given that Tad was busy with his nanny goat, now was as good a time as any to get an answer out of her. They only had one day before the boat set out again. That was enough time to get married if she'd just agreed. At the door to her room, he paused, and the thumping in his chest got harder. What should he say? Tell her you love her. He'd do no such thing. Besides, it wouldn't help. She didn't want his worthless heart. She wanted a house. Well, then give her one. But he'd have to live there, too. Huck stared at the door, debating his conscience. Just thinking about having to join civilized society made him itchy. He wasn't nearly as ignorant as he'd been when he'd run off all those years ago and could play the part when necessary. Still, he wasn't learned enough or polite enough or slicked up enough for most folks. You don't care about most folks. You care about Tad and Hallie. True enough. So what did they want from him? Tad was just a child. He didn't ask for nothing other than to be loved. But Hallie? Well, she was a woman, and women were like birds. They needed nests. Huck swallowed a lump that rose in his throat. He could stand settling somewhere for part of the year. That would make her happy. He wanted to please her, maybe even more than he wanted to please himself. All right, then, he mumbled. I'll do it. Uh, and that's the part that that rung through to me. And uh, and there's a, a in in Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Huck has a very clear moment when he makes a, a major sort of moral conscious decision. Uh, and the famous line is in uh, uh, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, chapter 31, uh, wow. where he says he's he's not going to uh, to turn Jim in, uh, who is the um, escape, escaped enslaved person that he has kind of been helping along the way. And, and according to everything that he's ever learned, the right thing to do is to turn him in. And he says, all right. Uh, I, I'm not going to do it. And he says, "All right, I'll go to hell." And <laughs> and the way the way that that I read this book is is almost the same rhythm of text, mm -hmm. and it is in chapter 31 of Taming Huck Finn <laughs> too, which I just was delighted in. Uh, I wish I could say I planned the chapter 31. <laughs> I did not plan that. I was mirroring that whole argument that he's mm -hmm. having his conscience and, and bringing his conscience and his heart into alignment. I was doing that, but I had not even thought about it being in chapter 31. So <laughs> that's, I don't know, maybe he planned it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, the one thing that I kept looking for in Taming Huck, before we go on and talk a little bit about uh, about Tom Sawyer, mm -hmm. is, is that there is no Jim. I kept wanting Jim to appear because we're here we are 15 years later and I wanted uh, Huck and Jim to have a continued friendship and for him to maybe reappear in this future time frame, but he doesn't. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about that? Yeah, I had uh, I had thought about bringing Jim back, but every time I tried to sort of put him in the scene, it felt forced. It, it just, in my mind, um, when Jim goes off to live his life, he goes off to live his life. He doesn't necessarily hook back up with Huck and Huck has left, Huck is gone. And he's been gone for many, many years. And so um, for one, it just didn't feel like it. It just felt forced, it felt like author forcing something. And then two, I thought, you know, I want people to see that Huck has grown from his relationship with Jim, his views on people and his, his 
lack of prejudice. I, I wanted people to see how that had evolved in his life in other ways. And so that's why I bring characters in, such as Mr. Lacey, the boat steward, and, and many of the stewards in that day were African-American, you know, free men, but they, you know, that's who they were. And um, so he makes friends with Mr. Lacey and and he actually ends up bunking with him. He has to bunk with him because he has to give his bunk up. And and you you kind of see Huck's relationship with this man in a way that is very different than other people would have viewed this man at that period of time. But so so you can see him interacting with people in such a way that that relationship with Jim really changed him. And I wanted to show it in in some other way. So that was one of the reasons that that Jim just just didn't come back. It just didn't feel like it made sense to me and it felt like I was forcing it. So mm -hmm. why? Oh, uh, and uh, so, but Tom Sawyer does make an appearance and uh, Huck and he are still friends. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, can you tell us a little bit, uh, sort of set the stage for Tom Sawyer Returns? Because it, it actually takes place earlier than Huck's story does, yeah. even though yeah. you wrote it afterwards. Uh, it does. I, I wrote Huck's story first, but Tom's takes place earlier. In Huck's story, Tom's married to Becky. So I asked myself, okay, so Tom's married to Becky. Now, how did this happen? You know, did it just happen? Should we just assume it? Well, you know, one, Tom Sawyer never struck me as a guy who's going to hang around his hometown any more than Sam Clemens was going to hang around that hometown. He was out of there, you know, as soon as he could get out of there. Um, and in the original, Becky is very much a product of, of her era, of her time. She's a spoiled child of an influential judge, the center of attention, kind of the Victorian ideal of girlhood. And and I asked myself, well, I know why Tom falls in love with her. It's kind of like stricken. She's beautiful, you know. But why does what's Becky see in Tom? He's this little ruffian. And and so I began to ask myself, like, why does she take a chance on him, even to begin with? Why does she decide he's worth her time and effort? Because her parents wouldn't have thought he'd be suitable by any stretch of the imagination. So as I begin to think about that, I thought, well, maybe there's more to Becky than meets the eye. And, and during this time period that Sam Clemens lived, that I put Tom Sawyer in, we had a major war going on. And in the Civil War, what's going on? Well, Sam Clemens hides it out west. And I thought, well, you know, Tom could do that. And we saw Huck do that. But what else would Tom be doing? He'd be in the thick of it. He just wouldn't be kowtowing to authority. He'd be in the thick of it in some other way. So what made sense to me was to put him in the thick of it as a spy. And some of the early spies were working for Alan Pinkerton. And so Tom, as a Pinkerton agent, made total sense to me. And so him coming back to his hometown, what would bring him back would be danger for Becky, somebody he cared about, and, and the judge. And so that's kind of how it all kind of got set up was sort of like, well, what would bring him back? Well, we'd be danger. Well, why would an agent be coming back? Well, a conspiracy. And that was going on at the time. There was a lot of Confederate activity on the river. They were trying to blow boats up. They were doing all kinds of things to try to seize control of the river. So that gave me a perfect historical moment to bring those two back together in an adventure that I thought they needed to be in because they were in the first books. So. It is a great adventure. I just, it was a real page turner. And, and one of the things that, um, one of the aspects I really enjoyed was because we're in 1864, I think, for mm -hmm. Tom Sawyer Returns. And uh, the town of St. Petersburg, where Tom and Huck grew up and Becky grew up, uh, has been under martial law uh, from Union soldiers for about two years. Uh, and so tell me about how how does Becky uh, go from sort of that ideal Victorian girl uh, into a, a, a woman character that we can kind of connect to more? Yeah, I, you know, when I began to really uh, research for the time period, you know, um, <clears throat> Victorian women, th there was this ideal men had about them. The reality is, they weren't not like that. They were, they were strong. And, and, you know, these women that survived this war, you didn't survive a war like that without having a backbone. So um, I, the way I looked at it was Becky is either going to fall apart or she is going to get stronger. And I voted for her strength. And so when I began to, to write her, she emerged on the page very different uh, than I thought. 
Uh, a lot of Southern women, if you've ever met them, they can seem awfully um, not helpless, but, you know, oh, you know, I need you to take care of me. Yeah. But the reality is, yeah, you know who's in charge. Yeah. So, you know, Becky really is, is enters the scene in a very difficult situation. Her father, the judge, is under suspicion of treason. Her cousin is off fighting with bushwhackers. Um, she's got a marriage proposal from Alfred, remember him, <laughs> from Tom Sawyer book. Um, and, and she's trying to decide, what do I do? You know, I, I, I've got to seek safety for myself. I've got to seek security. Um, maybe I should accept Alfred. At least we're friends. Um, her dad isn't real keen on that, but he's not in a position to say no. Uh, so Becky's making some tough decisions. She's trying to take care of the family, hold it together. And all of a sudden, Tom Sawyer literally drops back into her life. Yeah. On her kitchen floor. Uh, and one of the um, aspects of the story that I really enjoyed was how you know, these these characters who, you know, Tom Sawyer as a boy plays plays Robin Hood in the woods with these boys. They grow up together, but now they're adults and and they have found themselves sort of in different place, different sides of this conflict. And mm -hmm. now he's back in the mix. And how how do these boyhood friendships and relationships, mm -hmm. how how because there's there's still people he cares about. Mm -hmm. uh, but there and or, or people that Becky cares about and that Becky grew up with, but you know, and they they care for one another, but they are on different sides. Yeah, and yeah. I found that that um, uh, a very enjoyable aspect of of the story. And and the thing is, this war was a war like that. The Civil War was a war like that. Nowhere was that more evident than in Missouri. Yeah, can and you talk about that a little bit? Because that's so was interesting. Missouri was it did not secede but it wasn't for lack of trying. Um, there were, you know, it was such a divided state. You could almost divide it in half by the river, north and south, almost like the country. Um, mm -hmm. It was a very divided state and it, and it tried to secede, but then, you know, thanks to, the, uh, you know, some, some of the union comes in, you know, kind of takes over. I, I won't go into all the history, but what happened was Missouri ended up a state under martial law. And so, it was a police state for all practical purposes to try to keep it in the union. And so Hannibal, and, and in this case, it's St. Petersburg, um, is going to be a, a city that's under martial law. And there's going to be a provost marshal there, military police presence. Um, there's going to be people there on both sides, uh, constantly kind of working against each other. Uh, there were bushwhackers or uh, what they were, were basically like citizen soldiers that were fighting for the South. They weren't officially a part of any army, but they were raising all kinds of cane. Um, and then you had, you know, Confederate forces trying to get back in the state. So there's a lot going on in this time period. Um, and so in the stew, drops Tom Sawyer. And we don't know. Is he Confederate? Is he Union? I mean, he's wearing a Union uniform, but we don't know. He Yeah, I couldn't figure it out for a while. I was like, which side yeah, is this falling? And when he wakes up, he doesn't know either because he got hit on the head. So he doesn't have many memories. And so he's waking up trying to figure out, piecing together, who am I? Where am I? What am I doing here? And And, and, and Becky has to figure out what he's doing there. Uh, and unfortunately, when he drops in, he disrupts everything, uh, just like he always does. Yeah. And and so, you know, here she is trying to kind of smooth things over, keep her father from being arrested. Tom drops in. The provost marshal shows up to, to, to question her father and arrest him. Tom decides he's going to get in the middle of it and rescue Becky. And so he does. He gets right in the middle of it. And the provost marshal happens to be his half-brother, Sid. You remember him? Tattletale Sid. And so, you know, things don't go so well. Tom gets in the middle of it. Her father gets arrested. And so there's this little passage. I'll read just a little bit of it. But um, basically, <clears throat> she has just uh, seen her father get hauled away in, you know, in handcuffs. She shoved a chair into his path. Go away and leave me alone. Can't do that. Didn't you hear Sid? Yes. Do you always do what he says? Tom cleared her makeshift defense and straightened with a frown. I'll deal with him tomorrow. How? By taking his position? He'll lock you up for that lie the minute you walk into his office. See if he doesn't. Oh, come on, Becky. It was a joke and he knew it. 
He's no fool. Tom shrugged. That's debatable, but I trust he'll make inquiries before we meet tomorrow. Then I'll find out what he finds out. Before that, I need to know what's going on around here. Why is he so sure your father's a traitor? She wrapped bacon and cornbread in a napkin and tucked them into a basket on the table. Picking up a knife, she considered throwing it, but then she'd have to clean blood off the floor. Better to force Tom's hand and get to the truth, which might produce something she could use as leverage to gain her father's release. Why don't you start telling me why you stowed away on a steamboat? What steamboat? Tom set his hat on the table, visibly perplexed. He'd removed the bandage covering the injury she had carefully cleaned and stitched. Why did you remove the dressing? I didn't need it anymore. His complete lack of concern pretty well summed up the problem. He would do as he pleased, as he had always done, and chaos would follow. And it does. It does. <laughs> chaos does. So, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about, uh, and we are at a Valentine's Day program, and I think, you know, Tom and Becky's love, uh, and certainly her, her that sort of ideal girlhood and womanhood, uh, mm -hmm. does play a role in Sam Clements' real life as well, right? Yes, yeah. Um, and, yeah. Um, and maybe I can warm up uh, Brian Roy with his spotlight cam again, and maybe he could be down in the drawing room. Because uh, there's, there's some pictures of Mark Twain's family and uh, there's Mark Twain and his uh, wife, Olivia or Livy. Oh, and, you know, when when Sam Clemens first met Olivia, it was very much an opposites attract kind of situation, which is a, you know, a, a, a beloved trope of the, the romance story. Right. That's <laughs> Olivia there. That is a bust of Olivia, somewhat of what she looked like when she was in her late teens. Oh, uh, and she is, you know, he he describes Olivia as being sort of this wonderful blend of war, woman and girl. And and that he, you know, when he is um, uh, sort of wooing her and courting her through letters. Oh, uh, he just goes on and on about how, oh, she's, you know, he really puts her on a pedestal as this mm -hmm. ideal woman. Yes. Oh, uh, but as what happens is, you know, as they they do marry and they do raise children, you know, real real life does intercede. Oh, yeah. And I always got the impression as I, I read a little bit about them was, uh, it, you know, he talks about her as being this kind of, you know, girl woman. But when you kind of look at their relationship and and see how things go and how important she is to his writing and his 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 professional life as well as his personal life, um, I kind of wonder if she was sort of the backbone. Of I mean, that. She she is really one of his most trusted readers. You know, uh, uh, he's really writing for an audience of readers like her, uh, and uh, you know, it's there are are scholars today who really. Uh, think that it was really the presence of of her in his life and that that circle that really helped him to to write the fiction that that he has become well so, so well known for. So oh, in um in preparation for tonight, I peeked at something that I hadn't looked at in a while, um, and uh, about and it's sort of sad about because we're saying how how Olivia uh, is very much sort of running the household. You know he. As, a, as the person who's writing these stories, yeah. he's allowed to live in his dream world. And Olivia is really the one who keeps the household glued together. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, he, he lost her, sadly, in, in 1904. And you know, he talks about her as um, you know, when she dies, you know, she's just as beautiful as she was 30 years ago. There's not a gray hair on her head. Um, she says, you know, she was our breath, she was our life, and now we are nothing. And this is after 34 years of marriage. Um, he said, we have to, we, they had to figure out how to make plans. They've never had to make plans without Olivia. Oh, uh, so, and and they certainly, you know, she is from this well-bred background, and he is from the frontier, this frontier ruffian. Uh, so they very much had a, a romance uh, um, uh, that, that, you know, feeds into the stories that we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And and in a sense, when I was reading about their life together, that uh, I didn't base anything specific on it, but it just it did inform a lot of how I approach the relationships uh, between Tom and Becky and between mm -hmm. Tom and Becky. You know, kind of that um, that ideal womanhood, and yet, who what is she really like? 
Mm-hmm. And, and who, who is this woman Tom loves and why does he love her? Right. And, and what he really comes to realize, kind of like Sam Clemens did, you know, is this person is my rock. You know, she is my strength. She mm-hmm. is the one who enables me to go out and be a hero and be right. heroic and, and, and be bigger than life. Right. And uh, I mean, at one point, uh, Olivia in her in her real life writes to her mother uh, saying, I, I have to be everything. I have to be an amazing mother. I have to be able to entertain. I have to be able to have a dinner party. I have to have my kids be dressed perfectly. Uh, and so, you know, when that's sort of the, the flip side of this ideal womanhood. Yeah. 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 You know, she's she's, real she's kind of revealing what it's really like, you know, mm-hmm. like, we all get it. <laughs> We're yeah. like, yeah, yeah, we get you. We get you. Yeah. We know what you're going through. So, yeah. I so, love uh, and um, I think we can bring Jennifer back on yeah. and see if we can take some audience questions. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. I'm curious about our poll, too. Has anybody filled out our poll? Some people have. And if you oh. haven't yet, please do. Uh, I don't want to come back because I just want the two of you to talk all night. Oh, my goodness, how <laughs> fascinating. And you both are just so passionate about Mark Twain, as, as we all are. But you also have such breadth of knowledge and depth of knowledge. It's been just really delightful. Um, and I know that uh, our audience feels the same way. And Brian, thank you for sharing these scenes from inside the, the Mark Twain house. We do have some audience questions, uh, and so I'll get to those right away. And then please do vote in the polls because I'm going to announce poll results uh, at the end. And uh, Jacques, um, dear friend and and, and colleague, has uh, reposted the link for purchasing uh, Taming Hup Finn and Tom Sawyer Returns. So uh, I can't imagine if you had not made up your mind to buy those books before the conversation began uh, that you have not yet decided you need these books. So Goldie Edwards wants to know, and and several other people have upvoted uh, Goldie's questions. So are there other literary characters who you would like to revisit and do more of this derivative literature with? (laughs) Oh my goodness, you're putting me on the spot. Oh. Um, Yeah, I, you know, I've thought about that. There there is nobody really calling to me at this point, but there are characters in these two books that I have thought about maybe going on with. Uh, they just happen to be secondary characters because for Twain, the two that, you know, I, I wrote about, they're kind of his stars, you know, and, and there really weren't others. He, he did a lot of books that really spoke to his own life. Um, now, whether I take on something that relates to him, I, I don't know. I've been thinking about it. I've been thinking that would be a really interesting book to write. Uh, but so many people have written about him. So I don't know. But to answer your question, I don't have someone in mind but I'm toying with the idea of maybe taking some of these characters in these books and and spinning out their own stories. Can you please make us a promise that you'll come back and and talk about those stories once you've written them? Yes, absolutely. I would love to. I would 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 probably come out there and do some research. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We'd love to have you. Uh, uh, Michelle Gray says, and this is a related question, but a little bit different. do you have any plans to write any further exploits for Tom and or Huck? <laughs> I think you kind of touched on that, but. Yeah. That. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. I, I, I thought about that. I, especially at the end of um, Huck's book where he is there on the river. Um, I, I've thought about that. I've thought about that, but if I do, it will be a very different book, of course. Um, and, um, and, you know, Tad, he's kind of, He's just very hard to resist as, as a young boy. And so I thought, gee, you know, that'd be kind of fun to write him as a man. And so, yeah, some of these characters are calling to me and, and it's kind of like, yeah, I could take them there. Um, I haven't made a firm decision one way or the other, but a lot of it may depend on how, you know, readers ask what readers ask for. Because if readers are like, you must tell me the story, then I get really jazzed up and I want to tell them the story. So <laughs> sure, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good. That's that's very thoughtful of you. <laughs> um, oh, this is a great question from Darlene DeLuca. Uh, can you explain the public domain slash copyright laws on this kind of fiction? So mm. you know, you're, you're working with a yeah, character somebody has created. How does that work? Over 100 years. <laughs> pretty much over 100 years is, you know, what the what the rule is or what the law is. So. 
Okay. So it's it like goes into the public domain after a hundred years. Is yeah. That yeah. Okay. Uh, there, that's why there's all these, you know, Huck Finn on a donkey or whatever. I mean, there's lots of different. Yeah, there's out. lots of editions of these stories now with different things. introductions and forwards and things mm -hmm. like that. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to ask a question that piggybacks on on an uh, uh, audience member's question. Um, that question is, how long did it take you to write the Huck and Tom books? And I would ask. Um, a question that I often ask in these uh, programs. Can you tell us about your writing routine? Uh, you're obviously uh, very productive. And um, can you tell us what, you know, when you write and where you write and all that kind of stuff? Um, sure. I, um, well, I write here in this room. Uh, I have a desk over there. See, there it is. Uh, and this is my secretary, but this is mostly books for research and stuff like that. But I write here and I have my own space to do that in. And, and that's important to me. I need I need my own space to do that in. And and without the space and without a place to come and sit, it'd be hard to be disciplined. So I do write here mostly. Um, I try to, you know, set a writing schedule for myself every day so that I'm writing as much every day as I possibly can. Um, you know, there's, I mean, pretty much any really serious writer will tell you, you really just need to write every day, you know, make it a, make it a point to write every day and be disciplined about it. Um, but as far as how long it took me to write these books, it took me, it took me 10 years to get them out the door. Um, okay. because I rewrote them a lot. And, uh, I think when I first set out to write them, I wasn't where I needed to be as a writer. And I think that as I worked at developing my craft, the books got better and I was able to bring these stories closer to my vision for them. And so that, you know, I, I'm glad that it took me that long, honestly. Oh, so. that's refreshing, actually, then, <laughs> and kind of encouraging to other uh, writers, particularly maybe fledgling writers who might be frustrated. Um, I think that's a very helpful thing. Uh, and I just want to point out that Jacques uh, has uh, added some information to the chat saying that books enter the public domain after 75 years and that everything Twain published during his lifetime is public domain. Anything published posthumously after the 1940s or so is copyright protected. So thank you, Jacques. Yes. You're a font of knowledge, fount of knowledge. Yeah. Um, let's take a look. At, we're running out of time here, but let's see what the polls say. Have you read any books by E.E. E. Burke before? Uh, 16 people say yes, and 18 people say no, not yet. So um, let's get busy, people. Yeah. Uh, right? Hopefully that will be a yes next time. But listen to this. We asked, have you read Mark Twain's Adventures of Huckleberry Finn or The Adventures of Tom Sawyer? Uh, one person has read Just Huck. Six people have read Just Tom, and 25 people have read them both. So hey, there, uh, you go. there you go. Are you a reader of historical fiction? Um, 24 people said yes, they are, and nine people said not so much. And then let's see, uh, is this your first time taking part in a Mark Twain House virtual program? Uh, 20, welcome, 20 people have said this is their first time, so glad to have you here. Um, three people said they've attended at least one other, and 10 of you are regulars. So welcome back, regulars. And um, those, were, those were fun questions. Um, so it is just about 8 o'clock, and I don't, again, want this evening to end. E, I, I hope that you will stay a friend of the Mark Twain House and keep us posted as to your work as it continues. Um, I think even those of us who feel like we know a whole lot about Mark Twain, Huck Finn, and Tom Sawyer have learned an awful lot about <laughs> Mark Twain, Huck Finn, and Tom Sawyer. And um, Rebecca, you just did a beautiful job. Uh, you Thank know, you. And I'll, I'll mention, I know Jacques, I think somebody put it up in the chat. And you know, if there are folks who do want to spend some more time talking about uh, Huck's battle with his conscience, uh, which also mirrors Mark Twain's own battle with his conscience, Oh, uh, uh, we could talk about that more on February 23rd in one of our other programs, which is a smaller program, small group called Clemens Conversations. We have one called um, How to Reform a Conscience, uh, where uh, we, we can chat, we can look at some different excerpts and uh, by Mark Twain and, and have some extended conversation about that. 
to. That sounds interesting. Thank you. And that's on, on, on February 23rd. And Jacques just reposted the link. So please check that out. Um, and we'll see you again then. And, and I'll say, E.E., uh, e., it was just been such a pleasure uh, to, to read your stories. Uh, and I had not read one before this, and I've read several of them now. Right. Uh, and and I just it's been also just a pleasure uh, preparing for this evening uh, through through our emails and our conversations. So thank you so much. Yes, yes very much. And I am definitely planning my trip up to visit you guys because I have not got to get there. Virtual just isn't good enough. So. Right. <laughs> Well, that sounds awesome. Thank you both so much. Audience, thank you so much for your great questions yes, and uh, you. your chat and for being here and for your support. Mm -hmm. And um, let's do it again soon. Check out markplanehouse.org and see what we've got coming up next. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Yeah.